If you have never gone through a real estate transaction, this video is going to be for you. Specifically, if you have never gone through an investment transaction, okay? Specifically, even more so, into the short-term rental market. So, I remember when I was first going to buy my own personal property, which is this property that you can see here, I was really nervous about the unknowns, all of the things that we were going to go through, such as what happens after we put the offer in? What happened if something goes wrong with the inspection period? All of these little things that I did not know what to expect or what to do or how to handle them if that was going to happen. And so what I have done today is I brought in Avery Carl, who is the owner of the Short Term Shop, which is the largest short-term rental realtor brokerage across the entire United States. And she's gone through thousands of transactions. And so I got to ask her every single question that you would want to ask somebody, specifically her, if you were to be going through a real estate transaction. And so even if you're buying your own personal property and it's not an investment property or short-term rental property, if you haven't gone through the actual process and you have concerns, this video is going to answer all that for you. Now, at the very beginning, we're going to be talking about a couple of things about like what to look out for when you're hiring a short-term rental realtor, but then we get into the nitty gritty detail of that process. And what I love about it is every single time I asked about a specific section, section, such as when we go through the inspection, what happens if stuff comes back? She would not only explain what would you should do, but then give a bunch of scenarios of how to handle different situations from her experience. So this is an, a very, this was a very, very, very useful interview that gives you a ton of information and calms a lot of the nerves that you might be feeling if you haven't gone through it yourself. All right. I hope you enjoy. And so Avery, do you want to, as you take off your glasses, do you want to uh, give a little introduction as to who you are, your background, your qualifications for anyone who doesn't know you uh, yet? Sure, sure. So my name's Avery Carl. I'm a real estate investor first. I've got 250 doors, no partners, and um, was able to do that over the course of about five and a half years through st strategically investing in short-term rentals. Um, I'm the author of Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth, my book over there. Uh, host of the Short Term Show podcast and the CEO of the Short Term Shop. So we are the country's largest short term rental specific real estate brokerage or team. If you're in the business, we're under EXP. And we have done over 5,000 short term rental deals. So we have helped over 5,000 investors uh, buy cash flowing short term rentals. So um, I don't want to say I've seen it all, but I've seen the vast majority of things that can go really well in a real estate transaction and also yep. go terribly wrong. So happy to share that experience. Love it. This is why you're the absolute best to be on here. And just fuse just such badass things you just said there. Your own book, no other investors with your 200 doors or is it 250 doors? 250. 250. I want to make sure I get that one right. And then also helped over 5,000 transactions, all specifically around short-term rentals. Yeah. Right? There, there literally is nobody else to be able to, to talk about <laughs> with this stuff. Um, and so- you obviously have an outrageous amount of wealth around this, but we're going to take it all the way back to like step one, right? So for those people who are just, just, just getting started, never done a transaction before, um, kind of it just paint a picture for them what it's like to actually buy a property and work with a realtor. What are some of the steps they would go through? Like, how, how would you explain that for, to somebody who's never done it? So I would say if you if you want to buy a short term rental, you have to really choose your agent carefully because any agent that you just walk up to and ask, you know, somebody in the car line at your kid's school or your aunt or your cousin or so and so, if you say, hey, do you do short term rental transactions? They're all going to say yes, whether they do or not, because they want your business and there's nothing wrong with people wanting your business. Yeah. So you do have to do a little more research and dig a little bit deeper to make sure that they are knowledgeable about that. Um, to I'm give actually, an example. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I was actually gonna give an example real quick. Oh, because because be literally right before I was hopping on this call, uh, Taylor Jones, for, who's the head of acquisitions with TechVestor, we were just going back and forth. We talked for like an hour before hopping on and somebody DM'd him saying, hey, I bought a home for $750,000. My realtor said it was gonna make $120,000. And we just went and looked up the data like within a second. And it the best you could probably do is about 70,000, 70, oh, maybe 80,000. And that's my goodness. the realtor said like, hey, I, that, that's how well you can do, right? Which is terrifying to me. So anyways, I, I'll let you give your example because I don't think that person has true short-term rental experience. No, no. They, I mean, they, it doesn't sound like they do. No. Um, so an example that I've, I've had personally 
is uh, back when we had an office in Nashville, we we've since shut the Nashville office down because the regulations are too difficult to navigate. Yeah. I had somebody call me up, uh, said, hey, heard you're the person to talk to about buying a short term rental. I've already got it picked out. I'm ready to make an offer. And I said, great, let's see it. And he sent me the address and he goes, it's beautiful. I mean, it was a beautiful house. It was a craftsman style, had been beautifully redone. And um, he mm. said it was a million dollars, which back in 2018, a million dollars was a lot more than it is now. So this was a yeah. lot of house. It was really expensive at the time. And he said, all right, let's make the offer. And I said, well, have you checked the regulations? Because this is by no means zoned to be a short-term rental. Uh, and he was like, oh crap, I didn't even realize there were there were things that couldn't be done. Jeez. And so if he'd called the wrong agent, somebody who doesn't do that often, they'd have written that offer and he may not have figured that out until after closing. Yeah, that's see, that's a, that stuff blows my mind <laughs> because like imagine, because you know how much detail I go into before actually buying a property with TechFester, right? And so for the people who are just out there like, hey, that's a good looking property. And then they just, let's put an offer into it. I can't understand how those people operate at all yeah. they, like how much money do you have laying around that you can just be like hey let's let's buy this property and not even be too concerned about it such a yeah yeah um anyways but okay so uh, somebody is going to be you know thinking about working with a realtor step one is ensure that they're a, they are a short-term realtor a true short-term realtor or have that kind of experience and the good thing about the short-term shop is that everybody has that experience, right? That's why you guys specialize in it, which is so useful, which is why I wanted to make sure to have you on this call, right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, what what would be sort of the next step? So they've, they've picked the realtor and now we go from there. Yeah, so there's a few questions before we move on to that that you want to ask a realtor to make sure that they do have that experience. Um, because I know a lot of people, at least when they come to us, they've been doing a lot of research, like listening to all the real estate podcasts, not necessarily the short-term rental specific ones, those and things that, you know, like Bigger Pockets is a great example. Great, amazing, amazing podcast with lots of great information. But if you start at episode one and work your way through, you're still in a lot of information that they were saying was the thing to do, you know, 10 years ago. And then people are trying mm -hmm. to apply it now. So, um, a lot of uh, a lot of investors will mistakenly think, oh, the agent who who answers my call first will be the one that gets the deal. Again, you could run into that situation that they all that means if somebody answers your call is that they happen to be right there by their phone when the phone rang. Yeah. So you want to ask a few questions. Um, you want to ask them how many deals did you do last year of those deals? How many were short term rentals? Because you want to gauge not only short term rental experience but just real estate transaction experience in general. Um, so, you know, a good example of that is I call them Aunt Susie agents. So everybody's got an Aunt Susie that's been in the business for 20 years and they do like two deals a year. Yeah. So two years ago, when there were like a hundred offers on every single property, if you called up Aunt Susie, she probably would have told you, oh yeah, let, let's offer 20% under asking. Let's, let's negotiate here. And she probably wouldn't have realized because she hadn't done a lot of deals recently that that's where the market was. And now two years later, the market's completely changed. Aunt Susie probably like did a few, one or two in 2021 and said, oh, okay, the market's crazy right now. You go to Aunt Susie now, she might still be telling you because she doesn't do a lot of deals. Hey, the market's really crazy. You need to offer over asking when you don't. So you need to not only make sure they have that short-term rental experience, but make sure they're doing a lot of deals because that means that they have their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the market, what works, what isn't working, um, you know, just what the general temperature is. So before, so before you hop, so that's great advice. Like it makes a lot of logical sense, which is what I'm a huge fan of when something makes logical sense. Right. <laughs> so um, before we get to those, the next questions, uh, the, is there a faster way for somebody to be able to figure out how many transactions somebody has done? Like, is there a website where people can see that? So not really, you'd have to have MLS access, which means you'd have to be an agent. Uh, sometimes agents will update their Zillow profile with the closings that they've done, but it's not automatic. So, oh. and then we honestly, we quit updating that because Zillow, you know, Zillow is technically a competing brokerage. So we don't put our deals in Zillow anymore because they're collecting data and they're collecting mm -hmm. data on our clients so that they can then you know, market yeah, to yeah. them. So we haven't put deals in, in Zillow in like probably three or four years. So something to think about, but it's, it's Got really it. hard to be able to see how many deals anybody's actually done. So, so you actually, you're saying that the short-term shop doesn't upload their deals to Zillow. 
Nope, we don't. Oh, wow. So if you were to be just searching on Zillow, then you wouldn't actually be able to find uh, any of the short-term shop deals. No, like if you went to our short-term shop pro I mean, profile on Zillow, yeah. I think there's maybe like 50 or 100 deals in there. And then I, it just says at the top, like, hey, we don't work with Zillow anymore. If you have questions, reach out to us, go to our website. Uh, because really what Zillow is doing is farming all these agents that they're selling leads to all of their leads information so they can then kind of cut the agents out, gotcha. uh, which isn't really working. They're kind of like backtracking on that now. But anyway, uh, so Zillow would be the only place, but only if agents diligently upload everything that they that they do in there. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so what are the other questions that we should be asking a realtor before hiring them? Um, you want to ask them how many deals they've done, how many short-term rentals they were. I mean, it's not a deal breaker if they don't own their own short-term rentals, but it's definitely nice if they do, uh, just because there's some empathy there. Like I will never forget how terrified I was on my first short-term rental deal when like as an investor, uh, and I remember now when we're working with clients, how scared they are. I remember what that feels like. So that definitely goes a long way. Um, and then also, you know, one thing that people don't think about that uh, maybe I just read too many business books and this is just kind of like the way I am is looking for emotional intelligence in an agent. So, you know, agents who are like, I'm a bulldog, I'm a beast, I'm gonna fight for my clients. That's not how negotiations work. You know, just like we gentle parent now and we don't smack our kids. Yeah. Um, uh, the other side of the deal doesn't enjoy being smacked either. And you're not going to get as far smacking them as you would using some emotional intelligence to negotiate for your client rather than like trying to smack everybody around. So I don't, I will not hire an agent who says stuff like that because that tells me they're not going to get me as good of a deal because they're smacking people around. It's that 2023. Is, we're emotionally intelligent now. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 uh, almost genius in a sense where it's like you understand. <laughs> like I'm just thinking about it in the sense of like how strategic that is in a long term sort of format, right? With with the ability to understand that people you're going to be hiring have that emotional intelligence, to be able to understand how the person on the other side of the transaction is feeling, kind of figure out a way that you can cross collaborate, make everything work for everybody, and then get that transaction done properly rather than right. bulldoze, bull, bulldozing somebody, right? Yeah, Anyways, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah, 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 it definitely doesn't work. It's annoying, to be honest, when, when yes. it. <laughs> it makes you want to not, you're just like, okay, well, I'm just going to ignore this person unless I have to work with them, right? Um, right, I'm well, and it, when agents get a reputation for being like that, then it makes other agents, you know, especially in a multiple offer situation, if, if I'm a listing agent and my client says, okay, we've got these three offers that are really similar, what do you know about these agents, which happens all the time. They say, what do you know about each agent? Which one's going to close it? Then I'm, you know, I'm going to say, well, I've worked with this one a hundred times, been super smooth. They'll get you mm -hmm. to the finish line. Or, you know, this one is going to scream and kick and, um, you know, ask for the world, try to beat you up on yeah. the, and make threats and all this stuff. And like, it just, it doesn't work. Yeah. So yeah. It makes yeah, a difference. Sure. Yeah. People yeah. get reputations for that. Yeah. I mean, the real estate agents have your, your base, a lot of the work is reputation as well right so there's a lot of obviously like the legwork and the negotiation and whatnot but you still have to be a person that you can work with right and that other people right. can work with makes sense um so what i wanted to ask here okay so let's say we've asked those questions to the realtor we've decided on the realtor that we're gonna be hiring now what does that sort of next step look like when you're working with the realtor what should you expect from your realtor and what would be almost like over asking for your from your realtor at the same time Oh gosh, I could, I could talk about this for ever. <laughs> so in terms of sending deals, your, your agent should be able to send you deals, but a big part of being a real estate agent is a lot of driving. I know when I'm looking for a property in my free time, I'm cruising Zillow. I'm cruising realtor.com if I'm not licensed in that market. And I might find something that my realtor didn't send me. And that's okay. Like it, you, it doesn't have to be like, a, Oh, well I found this. So I'm not going to use this agent because just send it to your agent. Um, because we can't, there are going to be things that we might not have seen. Like maybe they were put on a weird MLS, uh, things like that. So if you're cruising Zillow, like by all means, send it to your agent, they should be sending you deals though. Okay. Um, but don't, you know, be a, a stickler if you happen to find one. Okay. So here's, here's something I actually want to mention before we continue okay. everything that I teach my students is how to take all the data condense it down to what's the the best data and then building a buy box off of that so in other words 
you know, if you're going to be going to um, Memphis, Tennessee, there is, I know for a fact, there is a very small section of Memphis, Tennessee that you should buy in and the rest should be completely ignored. And it's not necessarily one specific zip code. It's more of like a, a bordering area. Kind of like if you could draw a little circle around a certain spot, like that's where you should buy. You should only buy, you know, a certain size bedroom and you can't pay more than this amount. And if you can do all of those things and find that property, then you're going to have a very strong cash flowing property, right? So uh, as a person who has gone through this training, has built out their buy box and then goes and talks to a realtor and says, hey, realtor, this is the only thing I'm going to purchase, right? So it's like, can you find something that's within this buy box? Uh, how would that work on your end? So we'll definitely drill down to that buy box, but I would also ask my clients to have an open mind to the other things that might be slightly outside of that. So, um, because there, you know, if you look, if you tell me your budget is 500, we're probably going to set you on a search up to 550, just because yeah. there may be room to negotiate down or, you know, there might be a few nuanced things. So for example, I bought a property recently in a, a state that I'm not licensed in. So I had an agent, um, that the short-term shop's not in either. Uh, so I had just an outside agent and we had our, our buy box and what we ended up buying, he sent us a random email on a Friday and said, Hey, I know this is not what you've been looking for. It's a little further away from the area you've been looking for, but it's a probate sale and it's really, really cool. And it has these extra buildings and it's like awesome. And so we said, oh, we'll take a look at it. And we're like, oh my God, this is the coolest thing we've ever seen. This is going to be awesome. And that ended up being what we bought. Hmm. So, you know, don't, I see people miss deals all the time because they're like, well, it's, there's one thing outside the buy box that, yeah. that I didn't want when they're new anyway. Like okay. if you've bought a few in a market already, you, you yeah. probably know, but every now and then there can be these outlier things. Like, for example, if it's like a, crazy amazing like the coolest property ever with all the amenities but it's two miles outside the buy box you're probably okay that's probably something you want to look at but when people say or you know what actually the thing i see the most is when they're like only send me deals with x amount of cash on cash return oh. there is no way for someone other than you to know what you're going to be able to do on a property um oh, so that's oh. a big one all the students that are going to be listening to this will have gone through so much training that they won't even think it that way. So <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to worry about any of that for anyone who's coming this way. They don't, yeah. they, it's all about the price to rent ratio, right? So the, what is the revenue on that property compared to how much I can purchase it for? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the cash on cash, it will be like a, a sort of second to that. But uh, um, one thing, so this is actually a good lesson, even for me with the way that I've been teaching is, is I've been very strict on that buy box, but you are right where, if there is something outside of the buy box, it could potentially work, right? And okay. and I'm gonna say could potentially. And the reason being is because if it's two miles away, that that may may be too far, may not be too far. But the reality is, is that if a realtor does send you a deal like that, all you have to do is then vet the data that's around that property specifically and confirm that that property that you're looking at would actually be a good deal. And so, yeah. um, you know, for any of the students watching this, that would be exactly how you do it. And that's actually how I did it as of this week. We got a property. Uh, that was in the Poconos area that was outside of one of the HOAs. So it wasn't a part of like a community and the lake was a little bit further away. And so I had to take that individual property. It was so, such a nice property, like a, a huge log cabin, 4,700 square feet. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Like massive lawn, uh, didn't have a pool, but had the potential to put a pool in there. And so I vetted the, that property uh, up against the data for there is kind of like a one-off opportunity. And as long as we could put in like an above ground pool with a deck around it, it would hit the numbers we'd want it to hit. But if we didn't do that, it wouldn't work out. But it was a, the realtor did exactly that. They're like, hey, this is an incredible property. You should just maybe check this one out, right? So I think that that does make a ton of sense. Yeah. And I mean, they shouldn't be sending you a lot of crap that's completely outside your buy right. box, but every now and then, like, don't dismiss that. Yeah, because, and that's, I think a good realtor, like this guy who sent it, knows that that property is so nice that it could have the potential, right? And it was priced well. So that was a nice other little benefit of it as well. Yeah. Um. So, okay. So you, we tell our realtor to, to set up a buy box or we ask the realtor to set up a buy box. And I love that right away. You're like, okay, make sure they're not too strict on the buy box. You're already given the the sort of requirements, right? Um. 
now that they've done that and they have that ready to go, what's sort of the next things that can that are going to be happening? They're going to be sending you deals and you're reviewing them or or what's happening? Yeah. So your agent should be sending you deals. You're reviewing them. Your agent should not ever be, and this is going to be contradictory to some other real estate podcasts, should not ever be analyzing a deal for you ever, period, end of discussion, because that is a gigantic liability for an agent to do. And if they're that careless with their own livelihood hmm. of things that could potentially, you know, end up in a lawsuit or loss of license, then they are certainly not going to be careful with your investment. That's very well said. That's that, that's actually pretty okay. So okay, so we're not going to re rely on that again. Yeah. <laughs> everyone here is going to be learning the skill to be able to do it themselves, and and we're going to make sure that they're doing it themselves. So now they've you've been sending them deals. They're analyzing them deals themselves and reviewing them. And now they found. Let's say they found one. They're like, I like this deal. What do we do from here? Right. So yeah. So if you like this deal it's probably time to start talking about making an offer and what the terms of that offer is going to be. And this is kind of where it's very subjective based on where we are in the market cycle, the market that you're in, um, the, the mindset of the seller um, in terms of like what you're going to, to be able to offer. And a lot of times your, your agent should be able to have uh, some insight. Like if they're very familiar with the other agent, um, sometimes we'll know like, oh yeah, you know what? These are new constructions. This agent does all these. He's part owner. They're going to be able to work with us a little bit better than just a random person. Um, so th things like that, but it's going to be pretty subjective, but it's time to make an offer. So you're, uh, when you're saying subjective, are you saying that the, the uh, terms of the offer will be different depending on where you are? Yes. Okay. And what are some of the terms that are typical that could people could be putting in there and why would they put them in there? Okay, so obviously your purchase price. Um, right now we're in a scenario where a a lot of closing, not a lot, a lot of clients, a lot of buyers are asking for closing costs because interest rates are high and you can use those closing costs to buy down the interest rate. So understanding that if say it's a five hundred thousand dollar purchase price, if you offer five hundred with ten thousand in closing, that's actually offering four ninety. You are not offering full price. Um, so understanding that because then people are like, oh, we're giving them full price. No, you're not. You are asking for a $10,000 concession. Um, so like two years ago, you had to go when in the two years ago would be end of 2021. Uh, you had to make an over asking offer a lot of times with no, uh, appraisal contingency, which the most, most contracts are going to have appraisal contingencies, which allows you to terminate the contract. If the appraisal comes in low, because if the appraisal comes in low, the bank will only give you up to that appraisal price and you have to come in cash with everything else. Uh, so you had to do that a couple of years ago. Now you don't appraisal contingencies are totally normal. You want to keep those all the time. Um, so you're also going to have an inspection contingency and depending on the state, that will determine what you're able to terminate that property for under the inspection contingency. So in some states, it's more of a due diligence contingency and you could terminate for any reason that you want, no questions asked, end of discussion, like Texas, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, in some states, it has to be related to items on the inspection. You can't say, oh, I changed my mind or, oh, the numbers don't work. You, it has to be, you have to point to something on the inspection. Uh, Tennessee would be an example of that. Um, so other, uh, oh, um, some people will offer what's called as is. Um, offering as is is not the same as removing the inspection contingency. You never, ever, ever want to remove the inspection contingency unless you're very, very familiar with the market. And it's a scenario where it's a really competitive property where there's a lot of people offering. Don't ever do that unless you absolutely know what you're doing. But what you can do is offer as is. So the difference between those two things when you offer as is, it just means that you're telling the seller upfront, we're still going to have our inspection contingency. We're still going to inspect this property. Uh, the Having the contingency in there means that you can still terminate if something crazy comes up, but you're saying ahead of time, I'm not going to ask you for any money and I'm not going to um, ask you to fix anything. So mm -hmm. the price we're going under contract for is the price we're coming out of the deal on, um, but we're just going to keep that contingency just in case there's anything crazy. So all that's really helpful. And I want to mention that it's August of 2023 right now for anybody who's listening to this. And the reason I'm saying that is because you just mentioned a whole bunch of different scenarios that could potentially happen 
um, depending on the market at this time, right? So in other words, uh, you know, you're saying in, at, the, at the end of 2021, you had to ask for over asking right now, as of August of 2023, it's a different environment, right? right. And there's going to be times where these different terms in the contract will make sense and will not make sense, right? So it's not, there's no stamp that works across the board for every single market and every single time frame. It's just a matter of that market and your realtor should know how to put in an offer that could get accepted for your property. And not, you know, if you need the ability to potentially back out, have the ability in there, right? Um, right. So, so in other words, your realtor should be the expert to know exactly what to be doing at that time frame, not yourself. Exactly. Exactly. And, and one other thing that I would mention is don't be afraid to make a low offer on stuff. So we're really seeing this a lot right now because we're coming out of a, a really high, highly competitive seller's market into more of a buyer's market. And there's been a few times that like I'll post a deal in our short-term shop Facebook group and say, um, you know, Hey guys, here's the deal. Here's, what they've done, everybody wants to see rental history, even though it doesn't really matter because it's not data. It's just one little data point yeah. um, where we'll post it and we get like four or five keyboard warriors posting a whole paragraph about why that property doesn't make sense. In the meantime, they don't know that the seller is distressed in some way or they're old and tired and just want to get rid of it and they don't owe anything on it. They paid $100,000 for it 20 years ago. So while all these people are writing these tomes on why this property doesn't make sense to show everybody what great investors they are, the really good investors are throwing out low offers and getting the property for 200,000 under asking because yeah. Yeah. they asked, they made right. the offer. So don't get caught up in making sure everybody knows what a great investor you are by saying that things don't work. Just offer the lower number. The worst that can happen is they say no. Yep. Uh, it's, okay. So this is a great segue into the next part, which is people worried. <laughs> people are worried about losing their money, right? So like they're, they, they make an offer on a property and they have to put the money down on that property and it sits in escrow and they, they're concerned about actually not getting that money back for whatever reason. Can you kind of like, help people understand what that, how that works and, and, and what, why they shouldn't be concerned about it. Okay. So earnest money, um, in some States, there's one earnest money deposit that's fully refundable. If you terminate on the inspection contingency, appraisal contingency, or financing contingency in some States like North Carolina, there are two deposits an earnest money deposit. That's refundable for those three reasons. And also an additional due diligence deposit that is not refundable, period. Uh, I don't know, there may be other states like that, but if you're buying in North Carolina, there's two deposits, one refundable and one not. But we're talking about earnest money deposits right now. So the ways that you terminate, and it's going to be state dependent, and, and there will be different customary reasons in markets, is it for one of those three contingencies. So an inspection contingency would be, hey, there's some things on the inspection we're not happy with, we're going to terminate. Financing contingency is if for some reason you no longer qualify. Now, you really truly do have to not qualify to be able to use that contingency and get your earnest money back. Um, the lender will have to write an official letter that they could lose their license if they lie about. So don't put them in a position of you got cold feet. Hey, please write me a, a letter that says I'm denied because I don't want to buy this property anymore. That's not cool. Um, don't put somebody else's livelihood in jeopardy because you got cold feet. So, but if you really don't qualify, no problem. They'll write it. Um, appraisal contingency. So some states do this differently. Like in some states, the appraisal contingency is kind of part of the financing contingency, and sometimes it's separate. So uh in a lot of states, if the property does not appraise, you have the ability to terminate and get your earnest money back. Now, ideally you would be able to negotiate the seller to come down to that appraisal value, or maybe you guys meet in the middle somewhere, you pay a little extra cash, they come down a little. Um, or I've seen, you know, in the worst, most competitive scenarios, buyer just pays the extra cash to get up to that appraisal. We don't really have to do that right now because it's a buyer's market. So most of the time you're seeing sellers come down to appraisal value or at least negotiate, uh, but you can terminate on that. And um, so those are the three. And I, where, where I see buyers mess up and get their earnest money, well, have their earnest money jeopardized is when they try to get really cute with the contingencies. Like, oh, I'm going to make an offer on 10 properties, even though I'm pre-approved for one mm. and whichever one I can get to come down the most, 
on the inspection, that's the one I'm going to go with and I'm going to terminate the other 10. Well, there are, you don't, in some cases you have to show uh, exactly why you're terminating in the inspection. In other states, you don't, but it's when you start doing stuff like that and acting in bad faith that you can get in trouble because most states in the contracts, you can lose your earnest money for what's called acting in bad faith. And mm. all of that, what nobody can decide who's acting in bad faith except for a judge. Uh, I haven't ever seen a lawsuit happen where where that happens. But if you start getting a little slimy and and doing some weird things like that, it can happen. So keep that in mind. Like I said, I've never seen it happen, but I don't want anybody listening to this webinar to be the first one. Yeah. Okay. That's a really good, really good point uh, to be said there. So uh, as a, a sort of summary there, there's, there's multiple different reasons as to why you'd be able to get that earnest money back. Right. Mm -hmm. And the earnest money, how, what, how much typically is earnest money? Cause obviously it's not the full down payment that you're going to be putting down. Right. So how much is that typically? Depending on the market in the state, anywhere between one and 3% of the purchase price is okay. typically what we see for earnest money. Uh, that can change. So like if a property has been sitting on the market for ages, you can probably get away with less. Uh, if it's really, really competitive, just hit the market yesterday and there's 20 offers already, the higher your earnest money amount, the more seriousness it kind of shows that you want to close the property. Gotcha. So um, that can make a difference in getting your offer accepted too. Okay. I've actually, I've actually, uh, the, the, I've actually talked people into losing their earnest money to just back away from a deal because they'll have me evaluate the properties to figure out like how much it'll actually make. And I'll, I'll do that. And I'll, I'll, I'll prove to them like, Hey, this is a really bad purchase. You know I mean, this is a really bad decision. And, uh, and they're like, well, we're going to lose our $3,000 that we just put down on this. It, it must've been one of those scenarios where they wouldn't be able to get the money back. And I, I told them like, yeah, but you're, if you go ahead with this property, you're going to lose like thousands and thousands more. Right. And they under, they understand that logically and they're like, okay, worth it. And so they lose their money. Now, mm -hmm. With that being said, that's obviously why we build these buy boxes prior to actually doing that and evaluate the properties before we put offers on them and things along those lines um, to make sure that you're not just, try, you know, you know what to expect from the property that you're going to be getting uh, yeah. if it does close and if it does go through. So, okay, cool. So we've, we've you know, we've figured out quite a bit so far and we're all, all the way at the process where we've put in an offer. Um, the realtors helped you put in that offer. We're not too worried about the earnest money that we're putting up. We understand there's ability for us to be able to get it back. Um, and so now we have somebody who has accepted our offer. What's hap what happens next? So offers accepted, you send in your earnest money, typically to the title company, and now it is time to start scheduling inspections. Okay. I actually forgot one thing before I get to that point, and this will okay. be a bit of a segue. So sure. to be able to put down, to be able to put in an offer, what requirements do, what do I need to have ready to be able to do that? So you... In some cases, they're going to want to see a copy of your earnest money check. That's pretty old school, though. Uh, very, I don't see that happen too much anymore. Uh, but you do need to have either proof of funds if you're paying cash from your bank. Some some agents will accept a screenshot where they can just see your name uh, and the amount that's in the bank account. But sometimes they want to see an official bank letterhead um, letter. And, or you need a pre-approval letter from a lender. And that's... And so... You don't always need a pre-approval letter. Is that right? What you're saying? Sometimes you just need the money. Yeah. If you're paying all cash for the property, mm -hmm. not just the down payment, you just need that proof of funds. But if you're getting any kind of a loan, you need to be able to show that you're able to get that loan. Okay. So the, and the pre-approval, uh, this is a good segue to kind of plug the mortgage shop, right? And so the mortgage shop is another company that you own. Is that right? Partially. Yes. Partially. Okay. And the mortgage shop is specifically focused on short-term rental loans. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you guys do just traditional loans? Do you do DS DSCR loans as well? Yeah. Conventional and DSCR. Okay. And yep. we'll do, I'll, I'll likely have another call with somebody maybe on the, the, on that team to help other people understand everything around that world, because we're not going to get into that along with also getting into uh, work. With <laughs> right. Um, oh. And so, okay. So we've, you, people under, have, have been able to put on the offer to get the offer ready to go. And then they get the inspection done. And so what's the importance of getting the inspection done as like the very first step? So you want to see, typically you'll have the contract will lay out a certain amount of time that you have to get the inspection done. Uh, usually it's between 10 and 14 days. Uh, you're probably going to have to work in between bookings if it's on, if it's a rental property currently. 
Um, but it's important to have somebody in there to check everything, you know, make sure the main things are working. And by the way, guys, there is no such thing as a clean inspection report. You're never going to get an inspection, an inspection back that says, nope, this house is good. There's nothing wrong. There's always going to be several, several pages of stuff. A lot of it's going to be little ticky tacky things that it's on every single inspection, but you know, they may uncover something big and the inspection is why like you need, that is why you need to have an inspection every time. Okay. And so then we get the inspection back and uh, what should we be it, let's say hypothetically, we have an inspection back that's perfect or minimal, right? Like no major repairs. Uh, what does that look like? And then you have another one that's the exact opposite of that, which is a whole bunch of issues. What's that look like moving forward? So again, it's going to depend on the market. And this is where consulting with your inspector is really important. So a lot of people will just tell their agent, just book me whatever inspector you normally use. They never call them. They never ask any questions. So you want to call and ask because there are certain things in certain markets that are going to come up on every inspection and then some things that are bigger deals. So you want to ask them what those things are. Like down here at the beach, everything corrodes. Anything outside that is metal is going to have rust on it because we live in the salt air, but other places it's not. But I've seen people almost lose really, really amazing deals because there was corrosion on the HVAC unit. And I'm like, oh my God, you're getting this for, it was, okay, I'll just tell you what the deal was because okay. she won't care. Um, it was 650,000, one tier back from the beach in Miramar Beach. Uh, and it was a little bit of a fixer upper, not too bad. That house is easily worth 3 million today. And she almost didn't buy it because there was corrosion on the outside HVAC unit, which there is on every single property down here. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so, but that's, you know, why you want to talk to your inspector and figure out what's normal, what isn't normal. Right. And um, the main mistake that I see people make with inspections is by say, is saying things like, oh my God, this light switch is crooked. Think of what else they're hiding from us in the walls. And oh, they think geez. that like, because there's one or two things that aren't perfect or, you know, that have wear and tear that the entire thing's fallen down. You just can't see it because it's inside. Um, that's probably not the case, um, but they, they psych themselves out because, oh, there's a few things that should have been fixed. Think about what all the other crazy stuff that he didn't even find was, right. um, right. that's not real life typically. Gotcha. Um, so anyway, uh, but you want to just talk to your inspector, they'll be able to tell you what they see every day and what is not normal and, and what you might, uh, need to have looked at further. Okay. And, uh, I mean, the, the scenario you're talking about there kind of sounds like, you know, those one-off stories that you hear where like the house is a total lemon and there's issues everywhere. And, you know, it's a, it's a super rare scenario is kind of what you're saying from your experience after doing about 5,000 transactions, right? So it's not anything to be con too concerned about. So um, how does a, would a realtor be able to, I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, if I'm, if I come across a property and I'm ready to get it, I've offered like $500,000 on it, but then there's, there's like, let's say $40,000 of repairs that need to be done for that property. And, uh, you know, I wasn't expecting that going in. How can a realtor help me negotiate with the seller to be able to maybe get some credits for those repairs? Or what would be a good way to move forward when once you get a, a, an inspection back with that high of a bill? So you always want to ask again, worst thing that can happen is they say, no, don't get emotionally wrapped up. And we'll, we already gave them full price and they need to give us blah, blah, blah. Like who cares? Just take your emotions out of it and negotiate just without emotion. So, uh, ask all that can happen really is that they'll say no, uh, especially the way the market is right now, you're usually able to get a few things. Um, so I would have your agent. I personally, would rather have money off so that I can do the fixes rather than asking the seller to do the fixes. In the primary home world, it's really common to ask the seller to fix a bunch of stuff. But as an investor, I know a seller is going to just half-ass everything and just bare minimum. So I want to have control of my the quality of my own repair. So I typically ask for money. Uh, a lot of times you, you can get more if you ask for money than if you ask them to fix things. Because especially if you're buying what we deal with is a lot of out-of-state owners who it's actually really hard for them to coordinate getting any repairs mm. done. So yeah. I prefer that, but some people prefer to just have it done and they don't want to mess with it. So there's no wrong way to do it, but that's the way I prefer to do it. Um, always ask. And if they say no, like that deal I was talking about a minute ago, um, the inspection was fine, but we came up with a bunch of like, we really, really dramatized a few things. And we're like, we want a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> 
it's completely ridiculous. And they were like, nope, we're going to sell it to somebody else. And we're like, okay, thank you. We'll see you at the closing table. So like <laughs> the worst that can happen is they just say no, say no. Okay. Yeah, but it doesn't hurt. You always want to ask and try to get a few things if you can. Gotcha. And just to, just to confirm on this, the communication is happening between the realtors, not the yes. individuals, right? So you, you're me as the the buyer, I'm talking to my realtor and saying like, Hey, let's ask, or you're advising me on like what we should do. Right. And then you're right. their realtor. Yes. So the agents are talking to each other so, and not the buyer and seller because things get emotional. The, don't big, big, no, no, do not do this. Um, don't go find the seller or the agent, the other agent on Facebook and reach out to them directly. If you're getting butt hurt about, um, about negotiation. So that's actually, I've seen that happen when I've been the listing agent, we had a, a new construction. Uh, it was like a 12 bedroom lodge and the, the buyer wanted, it, it took like eight or nine months to close. Cause it was pre-construction. Oh. The buyer wanted, uh, $200,000 off because the market had kind of changed over mm. the course of the time they were under contract. Right. And of course the builder was like, no, <laughs> this is yeah, what that's... you're under contract for. Um, and the buyer was so mad that they wouldn't give them $200,000. <laughs> they found my contact info or my agent's contact info who works for me and mine yeah. Yeah. and sent us this scathing email. And I'm like, I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they went under, so that's a, that's a ridiculous scenario. I understand where they're coming from, but the reality- I get it. Yeah, I totally it, got it. Right, but they bought it when they bought it, right? That's And yeah. the, the builder is building it based off of what they bought it for and everything, right? So there's, there's so many other factors. That's just an unfortunate yeah, situation get, for them. I get both sides of that for sure. Yeah, like, yeah. I would not want to have have had the market change. And, but the thing is like that property wasn't worth less. They just did, wanted a right. discount and I get it, but I also get- being a builder and having expenses and out of curiosity, to... what ended up happening with that deal? Um, I think they did get 50,000. Okay. So they just, uh, to make them a little bit happier, gave them something, which is yeah, still, they gave them, them $50,000. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's not, that's not a little, it's a little compared to 200,000, which is probably why they yeah. asked for so much to begin with, but a door in the face method, but yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. Um, interesting. So it makes sense. I love, I'm loving this as we're walking through every single last little step and, and, and not really missing out on too many things and, and going through these different scenarios at each different step. Right. So, uh, we've now gotten all the way through the point where we passed the inspection. We're happy with the home, you know, we're, we've negotiated and, and I think we're just ready to close. Is that right? Or is there anything else that I'm missing after that? There's one more thing that I've seen, um, people do a lot that that's really detrimental to you, uh, in the negotiations point. Don't ever, ever mention the L word, which is lawyer in negotiations, unless you are serious and it is to that point, because I'll see a lot of people who think they're like these shrewd business people who start saying, well, you know, tell them if they don't give me this, then I'm going to get my lawyer involved. That is the best way to make all negotiations stop. So what happens is when lawyers start getting mentioned, the agents are like, all right, we're going to have to hand this off to the actual attorneys. So unless it's a situation where you really are, you know, there is a legal issue and for real and not just, you know, you're threatening someone, don't do that because it's not going to make someone go, oh yeah, I guess I better give them this thing they want. It's going to make everybody stop and not want to say anything to anybody else and mm. say, okay, well, you, you will let the attorneys handle it from here. And that costs you a lot of money too. Right. So yeah. unless it's a real issue, don't throw that word around because it's going to backfire. It's just going to stop all negotiations because nobody wants to be involved. Gotcha. Okay. That makes, that's, that's great advice for anyone who might be yeah. thinking about that in that scenario. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we pass all that. We pass the expression and what's the next step from there? Uh, so typically then the appraisal will happen, okay. which you don't have to do anything for that. Lenders order the appraisal and coordinate that whole thing. So you're just waiting to see if it appraised. Okay. And we get the appraisal back. And if it, again, if it comes under, so say you're buying a home for $500,000 and it, the appraisal says it's only worth $450,000. Explain that scenario for anybody who has never experienced it before. Sure. So if it comes in under, there's three things that can happen. One, you can ask the seller to come down to the appraised value. That's the best outcome. Two, um, you can terminate the contract. Or three, 
you can come out of pocket for the difference or negotiate to some point in the middle. Um, typically right now we're seeing a, a negotiating to the middle or seller just coming down scenario. Um, but in really tight sellers markets, you can see sellers refuse to come down to appraisal value. Gotcha. Okay. In which case you could terminate and get your earnest money back. Okay. And so, you know, for anyone who hasn't gone through this before, right? If the, the bank says the property is only worth $450,000, they're only going to give you a loan based off of that amount, right? So you have to put 20% down, let's say on $450,000, and you have to come out with the other $50,000 for the uh, the seller, right? So you have to come out with more money than, uh, th than you were expecting in that type of scenario. And right. so, yeah, so, you know, and, and what you're saying is some people are negotiating to the middle, which means that people are um, in, in that scenario, they are willing to pull out some cash and give directly to the seller just to be able to close that deal. Depending, you know, on the quality of the deal. Yes. 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 Always depending. That's sort of like the, <laughs> the very first thing, always dependent. Right. Um, okay, cool. So we have agreed on the appraisal. That's pretty straightforward, easy to go, uh, could be a negotiating tool, could give you, save you money, some money. Uh, but every scenario is going to be a little bit different. We've passed that process. Now what's the next step from there? So at that point, it's really just waiting on the lender and title to get everything ready to close. Uh, at this point, they're probably the lender lender is probably going to ask you for a lot of documentation that you're going to feel like you already gave them six times. And that's just the way it goes. It's part of it. Um, and there may be a few final items that underwriting asks questions about like, hey, whose name is on this loan? Is that yours? Is that your spouse's? Is it together? Um student loan stuff, like anything that underwriting finds, they might ask for a little documentation of, uh, don't get frustrated with them. It's like that everywhere. It's just a thing. So and, you gotta get through it. Uh, could you define underwriting? Yeah. So, um, your loan officer will do your initial pre-approval process and they'll get you through that. And then what they do once you get under contract is they send it to, uh, for lack of a better word. I mean, so the underwriting department is kind of like an auditing department. They're looking all into you, making sure that uh, there's no, that you have disclosed everything in terms of all the debt that you have, the income that you have, it, that your income they will verify with your employer that your income is what you say it is because they're trying to protect themselves because they don't want to do a loan that they can't then, if it's conventional, sell to, or let me just forget the conventional thing. They don't want to lend on something that they view as too high risk. So they want to make sure that you're well able to get this loan and uh, pay the mortgage on it. Okay, sounds good. So just triple check in that you're somebody who could afford this loan. Exactly. Sense, yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Cool. So they you you and how long does that how long do they typically give you to get all that paperwork and how long does it typically take for them to come back? Um, underwriting. Uh, it's kind of a dirty word in the industry. It can take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. And oh, it yeah. just kind of depends on how fast they're moving, how fast you get them. The documentation they need is really going to determine a lot of things. You don't want to get, you know, to a point where y'all can't close on time because you drug your feet, getting them a document. So try to be as expedient as possible when getting them the things that they need. And sometimes it's going to sound dumb. Like who's, whose name is on this student loan? Well, obviously it's mine. Yeah. Um, so just, just know it's going to be annoying. <laughs> okay. So the most frustrating part is going to be that part. Having yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. That's the least fun part. Um, okay. So then we, we've gone through that and they have underwritten us and they're like, yep, you're good for this loan. Right. And so yep. now we've, we've gone through, we put our offer, we've negotiated, we've gone, uh, we've done the inspection. We negotiated off that. We got the appraisal. We negotiated off that if we need, if we needed to during these time frames. Uh, and now we've finished with the underwriting. And we've, we've gotten the like, hey, here's your $500,000 loan for that property that you can then close. What does that then look like? So the closing process will either, if you want to close in person, you'll typically go sign all the docs at a title company, or a lot of people will close remotely because they don't live near the property. So you can, uh, there's a few ways you can do that. Um, you can get, there's a notary at every UPS store, which is typically what I do. There's mobile notaries you can call that will come to wherever you are, your office, et cetera, and, and have you sign in front of them. And um, that's really it. Sign your document, send them back. And um, typically, depending on the state, you may not get keys immediately. Keys might not be given until the loan has fully funded. So that means the money has left the title company and gone into 
the seller's account. So if you're coming into town and you want to stay in your property that night, especially if you're closing on a Friday, just know that might possibly not happen. So I always just close remotely and then go like the next weekend just gotcha. to avoid anything like that. Gotcha. Okay. That's a good tip uh, for anybody that's eager. You know what I mean? That's like really excited yeah. and like wants to get the keys, but it's like, there's a lot, little bit of a time lag, like uh, just so they're prepared for that. Right. Setting yeah. their expectations properly. Um, fun little story on the signing, getting a remote notary to come out and sign with TechFester. Obviously we've done like a hundred and I think we're up to like 110, 120 transactions, something like that in 18 months. And uh, naturally see if the CEO has to sign for all of those and he's not always at his own house. And so we will do like these offsites where we all get together. And there was this one time we were all together in Scottsdale for, for the weekend. And uh, obviously we had a home closing at that time frame, and we were all out to a bar having drinks. And then the notary had to come to the bar, sit at the table on another table and do a whole bunch of signing with Steve. So we got like a photo of him. He's at the bar. There's like neon lights going on everywhere and he's signing for <laughs> the properties. Um, anyways. And then there's like another story where he's in the backyard and we're all in the pool and he's, he's signing for another property. It's just, anyways, <laughs> it, you can, you can sign anywhere. They will meet yeah. you anywhere you need to go. Yeah. Um, which is pretty nice about that. But um, okay. So that's it then, right? You, you've you gone through the entire process and you've signed everything. The, the money's been transferred and you get your keys and now you own the property, right? Am I missing anything? There's one thing that I want to point out that happens right before closing. And it's your, sometimes it's called a final walkthrough. Sometimes it's called a final inspection. Okay. Um, there are two people who can do that for you. Uh, really what it is, the the purpose of it is not a renegotiation. It's not like the, the first inspection. The purpose of it is just to make sure that the property is in the same or better condition than it was when you got under contract and when it was inspected the first time. Okay. Two people who can do that for you, yourself or your home inspector who did the initial inspection. So they're checking to, to make sure that things were done and done properly. Your agent is not one of those people. Okay. Um, okay. That's a big a liability. You either need yourself or your inspector, preferably both of you. Because agents are not licensed home inspectors or licensed contractors. And I mean, I couldn't tell you if something is fixed, right? I'll be like, oh, it looks like they did something to this, but I can't say, oh yes, they did right. this adequately. Um, good example, thing that's happened to me when I was new, um, I would just go video. I didn't think about it. And I actually didn't realize that in a lot of states, including Tennessee, uh, realtors are not allowed legally to do final walkthroughs. Um, so I did one for a client. He was like, well, just go video it for me. So I took a video, walked around, did three sixties of every room left. Everything was fine. Um, two months later, he called me like mad as a wet hornet because there was some, the, the floor around one of the toilets was soft and squishy. And there was really no way I would have known that unless I had actually sat on and used that toilet. Mm. And I didn't. So somehow the inspector didn't see it. So anyway, I am not home inspector. So I right. wasn't checking, you know, uh, squishiness of floors around toilets and things like that. I've seen another time where an agent did it uh, in a state where it's totally normal to use PEX pipes um, under the house. And the buyer was from a state where that's not okay, like a really cold state. And um, so agent did the final walkthrough buyer closes, buyer comes for like Christmas or something and gets under there and looks and it's Peck's pipes. And then he wants to go after the agent because the pipes aren't what he wanted it to be. Like how in the hell does an agent know yeah, that? Yeah. So, and there, she wasn't getting under the house. To right, look. right. So yeah, it's just best for you as the buyer to avoid those kinds of situations. Also, it's not always legal for agents to do it, depending on the state for you or your home inspector to do it. That makes a ton of sense. Most yeah. likely probably just best to have your home inspector do it and pay the money it's going to cost to have them do it because that's what they do, right? Yeah, it's usually cheap too. Like yeah. Bucks. Yeah. How much did you say, sorry? At least in the markets that we're in, it's like 75 or a hundred bucks to have them go okay. do the re-inspection. It's not much. For a second there, I thought you said 7,500 bucks. Here, no, know. no, no. Oh, not that's that. cheap. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not cheap. Um, yeah, so, I mean, th this is like... This is the thing where if it costs you $75 to do this final walkthrough, why would you not spend it on after spending, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars for a property, right? It's like, it's like, why would it, I always think about this? Like, why wouldn't you do your due diligence before dropping that amount of money on a property 
and moving forward with it. Like, why do people not check their data properly or do the work it takes to do that or hire somebody to do that or whatever it may be. So I think you're ensuring that your investment's actually going to be profitable, right? Right. Anyways, it's the same idea, same logic. It's like, it doesn't cost that much in comparison to what you're about to spend on this property or invest into it. Right. Um, Okay, so great last little pieces of advice there for anybody. It also just helps them understand like what your realtor can and cannot do. Uh, I think we've walked through the entire process though, right? Am I or am I again? Am I missing anything? I keep saying yeah. that, but I think we have. I think we've done it all. Yeah, we've gone from from end to end. Now, here's one other question that I keep forgetting to ask: is there's a lot of stuff that we had to do there, right? So there was the inspection, the appraisal, the due diligence, the underwriting, um, and then the second final walkthrough again. Uh, how much time? do I have to do all that? And does the amount of time that I get that, that I request matter? Um, yeah. So there will be kind of standards in each state. So for the inspection period, usually you seven to 10 to 14 days. Um, typically you'll have three to five business days, depending on the state again, to get your earnest money in. And you have within three days of closing to do your final walkthrough. Some states will also have uh, a time limit on when you have to have a confirmation of your financing, an official like, yes, they are approved, even though we're not closing till next week, they're approved on this date. So typically that that can be written in. That's a, a, a Florida thing, but probably some other states too. Um, if it's a really competitive property and there's a lot of offers, the shorter all those timelines are, the better off you are. If it's, you know, a property that's been sitting on the market for a while, you could probably get away with longer. But uh, typically right now we're seeing the average contract days that to close is between 30 and 45. Typically 30, 45, if you know we need to extend because, oh, there's a foundation problem. We need to get a foundation person to look, things like that. And and if, okay, so that's a good actually scenario you just brought up there. So if somebody does say, hey, um, you know, you 30 days to close and then they find the uh, an issue, can you extend? by 15 days if you need to? Yeah, you can ask and all parties have to agree and sign an amendment that says they agree to that. But yes, you can. Okay, so appreciate it for it. So good to know, um, you know, gives everybody a bit of a timeline of what to expect. And all this starts as soon as your offer is accepted, right? So it's not when, as soon as you put it in, it's as soon as accepted. I feel like that's pretty straightforward, but just want to make sure that that's uh, said. Now- Yes, when the seller signs. Exactly, okay, cool. And uh, anything else? <laughs> Start out one more time. Uh, I think, I think we've pretty much covered it. I think so too. I think that that gives like a really good understanding of what to expect all the way through. Again, first time home buyers, if they're, if they're going through this, this is, this is how it would end up working. Obviously we're doing so many, so much due diligence on the data prior to actually being able to get the property. Just want to make sure though, that you now have a true understanding of when you're working with realtor, what to expect, how that's going to go. Um, and all the, all the way through that process, so you can actually get that home and it's going to be profitable for you. Right. So right. Your realtor should be the expert. And again, uh, Avery's short-term shop is the number one uh, short-term rental shop in the entire country. So it only makes sense if you're if they have a shop in the or a location within the market that you're in to work with them because they are the most experienced, which is why I have you here. Do you want to do you want to give a little bit more of a plug as to why people should work with short-term rent uh, short-term shop and the mortgage shop uh, if they're going to be moving forward and how they can reach you, like? give everyone every possible piece of information that they can have so that they can make the best possible decision moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. So you can reach us at the shorttermshop.com phone numbers on there, emails on there, click schedule a consultation. Uh, so we've got offices in 20 markets. So we've got something for everybody budget wise, something for everybody type of market wise. Uh, so we offer a lot of options for our clients. Uh, we also teach all of our clients how to self-manage their properties for free while they're still under contract. So you're going to learn everything that you might learn in a $10,000 guru course. You're going to learn that while you're under contract with us before you close. So by the time you close, you know what you're doing already and you're not just floundering around with this huge investment that you've just made. And then you have us, you know, at for support basically forever um, to help you through things if you have any problems. That is awesome. I actually didn't know that, right? Because like the main thing I do is provide people with the skill to be able to analyze the data to make a good decision, right? The part that I don't teach about is how to actually manage the property. Because I always say, it's when you have one property, it's so easy and it's you, have, you can figure it out. But if you get the wrong home, it doesn't matter how well you manage or how well you put it together, you're not going to make anything, right? You could, you could figure out the best messages to send to somebody or clean it the best possible way. But if you're in the wrong spot and you bought it for the wrong price and it does not matter, right? right. 
And so I don't teach too much on that because I don't think it's as relevant as getting that part right. And that's what I do best. And so knowing that if somebody goes through the short-term shop, they're actually going to get a crash course on how to manage it, right? So now they've right. bought the right property in the right spot and now they're getting the crash course. So that's that's awesome to hear. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I got a little bonus. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. So I think we covered everything. Um, we've been, we were just like, we just hit an hour, which is awesome. Um, and we got through everything in an hour, which is crazy. So Thank you again for being on here. I appreciate it so much. Um, and again, every Avery did give her information of where to reach out. Just Google short-term shop and you'll find them. Okay. And also she has a really good podcast that you should definitely listen to. Um, so that's my final, final words. Anything else you want to say? Uh, I think that's it. Thanks for having me. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Avery. See ya.